uh, like I will teach uh, like we will discuss about path planning algorithms. So uh, wait a second. This. Okay. Yeah, so uh, what are path planning? So basically if you see over here, uh, wait, let me just start my pointer over. So suppose this is a robot and this is a manipulator and the robot needs to go to this manipulator and meanwhile it has to avoid all these uh, like there may be some static obstacle and uh, and and also dynamic obstacles like human so it has to avoid so the path that it generates to go from one place to another is basically the overall picture of path planning uh, so basically if you see the definition so path planning is a task of finding a continuous path between uh, initial uh, initial position and the goal position so and uh, and also it's very important that the path should be continuous so this is the basic definition which is commonly used everywhere with slight modifications depending on the applications uh, uh, i will uh, coming slide like, that, like like there are coverage path planning algorithms and where where this definition slightly changes but overall it remains same so coming to applications you can see that um, you know, the, the, this picture is basically a UR5 robot. Uh, it is used for building applications. And uh, this is a, a like a police robot, which is used for you know you know security and surveillance purpose. This this is ro uh, this robot is used in manufacturing industry, and this is a agriculture robot. So we see that uh, you know the robot. Uh, so basically, these are fixed based robot, and this is mobile robot. So robots are used in various applications, and in almost all the applications, without path planning, uh, robots cannot move from uh, move from one place to another or do a given task. OK, so uh, path planning algorithms are used by mobile robots, UAVs, autonomous vehicles. OK, uh, you know, uh, and the main thing of consideration in path planning is that the path generated must be uh, collision free. Uh, that uh, that's obvious, and on, and also it should be efficient in terms of like cost, distance, time, and other factors. Okay, uh, like efficient not only in terms of distance and time, but also like uh, suppose. And you know, like safety is also one consideration. Like uh, when the robot moves from one place to another, it should also uh, it should not only avoid humans, but also it should make sure that humans feel safe while the robot is crossing them. So all these things we need to take into account, and finally, you know, do our path planning algorithm. So coming to applications, as I've already told, it's used in warehouse applications, manufacturing, safety and patrolling, autonomous driving. Uh, maps navigation, social navigation. So we will look into some of these path planning, uh, uh, like applications with respect to path planning. So, so starting with uh, first is that how various path planning algorithms are classified. So basically, they are uh, they are classified into two types. Okay, uh, one is global path planning, and the other one is local path planning. So coming to Global path planning. Global path planning, as the name suggests, is that uh, you know the path. We already have a predefined environment map of the environment. Okay, like there's there's this obstacle, there's this obstacle. Okay, and all those stop obstacles are static. It means that they are not changing with respect to time. And so, how do we define a path from one point to another point, from start to goal position? So that is global path planning. And then comes the local path planning. Which means that there there might be some obstacles which are moving. There might be humans and other, you know, moving obstacles which whose position are changing with time. So there we cannot have a you know predefined path because you know uh, the the obstacles are changing their location. So there we need global path. Uh, so sorry. So there we need local path planning, which uh, basically you know like as soon as the robot senses the particular moving obstacle through any fun, uh, through any of its sensors like there are many sensors in robots like right? uh, lidar sensor that is light detection uh, light detection and ranging sensors camera depth cameras and, and uh, like ultrasound sensors and there are many sensors so as soon as the robot sends some disturbance or some obstacles in front of it uh, it changes its uh, it keeps the global path in its mind but also it creates a local path just so as, so as to avoid that obstacle. So we will discuss both these things and I will show you videos also that how we are actually implementing and doing all these things. 
Okay, so so path planning has to be both like uh, without both of these path planning couldn't work. Okay, like okay when there's a, stat a static obstacle or a, a static environment or a static state space, then global path planning alone could work. But if there is any other disturbance and all, then both of these is required. Coming to global path planning, uh, so I already mentioned about few path planning algorithms like A star, Dyke star, RRT star. RIT, okay, and local path planning includes uh, uh, so uh, like DWA that is dynamic window approach, TEB, and now nowadays like this reinforcement learning, the like RL and NN that is uh, neural networks. Uh, these are uh, these all uh, technologies have came into account. So I will explain you like why these are coming and what are the use of these and this so like um, in in the coming slides. Also, there are other path planning methods which include um, coverage path planning, potential field based path planning, human ever uh, path planning, etc. So this coverage path planning is basically, you know, uh, so normal path planning we do is that from one point to another, there will be one state line. But, you know, suppose uh, one application based is that, you know, uh, OK, forget about nuclear reactor. Like suppose we need a floor cleaning robot. So the main task of floor, cl floor cleaning robot is that not to go from one point to another. Rather, the main uh, its main task is to cover each and every you know location in in the floor or cover each and every, suppose there are square tiles on the floor. So its uh, so its task is that to cover each and every tiles of that floor. Okay, so that the entire floor is clean. So that is basically coverage path planning. So we define a path planning so that it starts from one position, covers the entire surface area, and then moves to the goal position. So here the definition slightly changes, and push, uh, and this uh, potential field-based path planning where you know the robot. Uh, so we here we use the concept that we take robot as positive charge, uh, positively charged, and ob and all the obstacles are as negatively charged and then we define all our hypothetical then we define a path okay so that the positive charge will avoid negative charge and so on and human aware path planning here we consider safety and other aspects of path planning and etc so you can see one uh, application over here like it's a, a tele nurse robot and basically it's ex like it's used in hospitals especially during covid times you know uh, uh, they were very helpful, like from going from one place to another, delivering medicines, you know, and all those stuffs monitoring. So coming to next is the top uh, visibility graph. So for every path planning algorithm, uh, so basically there are two types. One is, you know, sampling type, which which includes RRT, uh, RRT, RRT star and other path planning uh, algorithms. And the other type is like, um, using uh, graph search algorithm, so like A star and Dijkstra. So for graph search algorithm, we need to create visibility graphs. Okay. So first, uh, so here we assume that like how to create visibility graph is that like first we assume that the robot is a point object in a 2D planar space, and then we also assume that all the obstacles are 2D polygons, like it's, it's shown in the figure. So given the start and a goal point and all the obstacles. Now we define a visibility graph. So uh, the first step is that um, we have the nodes, uh, goal point, and vertices of all the obstacle. Second is that we connect all nodes which are visible. You know that is a straight line between uh, straight line, and also it shouldn't intersect between any two nodes. Like suppose uh, if you see over here, we connect. Uh, so for, suppose you are at start point. So what all edges can you see or what all vertices can you see is that this obstacle, this vertex, this vertex, this vertex and this vertex. So from start point you connect all these four, four vertex. Similarly, if you are here, you can connect this, this, this. Yeah, and that's it. So like at each and every point from is, uh, including a start goal and all the vertices of the obstacle draw state uh, draw unobstructed straight line. And then in uh, and also we have to include all the edges like this is also an uh, so all the edges of obstacle polynomials. So like this is an obstacle and it is the edge of this obstacle. So we have included this also. So now if we join all these things, so we have created a visibility graph. So uh, so so the nodes of the graphs are this is start point, goal point, and all the 
vertices of obstacles. So these are our nodes and the connective and the connectivity between nodes are given by these lines. OK, which we have created. So th this is the concept of visibility graph. And then once we have this graph, then we can implement any graph search algorithm connecting this nodes and vertices. So, uh, uh, yeah, nodes and edges. Uh, so that uh, in you know any graph search algorithm like a star dijkstra to to find a path between this start and goal position okay so i will explain so, so things will get clear when we go uh, when we go further so like this we have created graph so yeah so here if we see uh, okay so there are some questions like common questions which usually like we need to take care of is that what will happen if the size of a workspace is very large like uh, the thing is here if we you know so uh, in the if i go to previous slide so th there are very few obstacles and this space is very small so we have just created like this like on physically or you know uh, computationally okay just we, we have just drawn straight lines and created the graphs and nodes but in real situation the our workspace is very huge maybe sometimes okay for uh, for outdoor applications and all those things so in that case what we do is that we do mapping like um, uh, mapping in the sense like suppose this is a point p and this is a point q which are there on the so so basically this blue are the obstacle area let us assume and these whites are the uh, this white color the free space so this point p and q we assume that those are in free space OK, and then we what we do is that we map this point P to a particular point, a small tau of P in the graph, in, in the visibility graph. Similarly, we map this point Q that is goal point to a point, a small tau of Q in the visibility graph. OK, and then from this small tau of P to small tau of Q, we implement any graph search algorithm to to get a path. And then we again, so once we get this path, we again then demap the, those points to the real workspace to find the actual path between the two points. So this is basically you know, the entire concept of mapping. OK, and the second question is that if uh, like in, in the previous slide, I have assumed that a robot is 2D robot. OK, uh, like uh, sorry, uh, a robot is a point object in a 2D plane. But in real life situation, there is nothing as point object. Everything is like especially with robot like every robot is 3D and has some volume. OK, and due to this volume, it may collide with the obstacle edges. Like uh, suppose in this figure, if you see uh, this is the original obstacle, this blue one and the path is going from here to here to here because yeah. So it, in this case, if the robot has some volume, it may collide with the edge of the obstacle. So here in case what we do is that we kind of inflate like uh, inflate this obstacle. OK, like so that uh, so this initial this is the obstacle and we inflate it. So the red color shows the inflated boundary and then once we inflate all the obstacles, then we do our path planning algorithm from goal to final position so that even if the robot goes very near by this, it 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 has some sufficient distance with the obstacle so that it doesn't collide. OK, so like this. So how we do is this that we use the concept of Minkowski sum. So uh, so the solution is that inflate the obstacles and then implement the algorithms use the concept of Minkowski sum. So Minkowski sum is nothing. It's simple addition like uh, Minkowski sum of set P and Q is equal to X, which is given by uh, P small P plus small Q, where small P is uh, uh, are the elements of capital P and small Q are the elements of capital Q. OK, so and so this uh, yeah so this is uh, like element wise addition like if you take take one element in p and add that element to all the elements in q similarly second uh, take second element of p and all the uh, and add all the elements of q so like this you take them in sources system and, uh, and you will see that the resulting shape is somewhat like this okay um, Miskowski sum of obstacle and plus we take uh, minus r that is reflection of origin about the robot so i've just taken this but there's logic behind this so it, it depends on the orientation and rotation matrices i will not go into the detail but you can just take that r is the position of the robot just take the mirror image about origin and then do the Minkowski sum with the obstacle coordinates and you will get co that is configuration space of obstacles and then you can implement any path planning algorithm in this so this is the one concern so next is uh, so uh, so we will now 
like look for global path planning algorithm. So first we'll start with Dijkstra and mm -hmm. then I will go to A star. So if anyone has any doubt before starting uh, this Dijkstra algorithm, you can ask me. Yeah, actually, how do you do this mapping? What is the criteria you choose for doing this mapping? OK, so mapping is that uh, you can do like suppose you divide this entire workspace into, you know, great. So here uh, you uh, so if you look at this diagram, so here we have used adaptive volumetric grid decomposition. So you can use instead of adaptive, if you first what you do is that you uh, uniformly. So first I will I'm telling you that how do we do mapping? OK, then I will tell you that what are the criteria. So basically first you uniformly divide this grid. And then what you do is that you take uh, you see that suppose this point P lies in this grid. So then you join the point P to the nearest node. OK, basically these intersections are the nodes of the visibility graph and you just join to the nearest node. So that is the mapping between this and the function in, that is here capital tau of P. So uh, the function by which it is joined is maybe the ma mapping function. So like this and the criteria we use for mapping is that you know the this entire path should always lie in the free space. Like, like if you see uh, I have mapped this point P to this point a small tau of P in the graph. So this mapping path should entirely lie in the free space. It shouldn't lie in this blue region that is obstacle region. Otherwise there's no point of path planning like the path will collide. Um, and uh, how do you decide the grid size in which you are uh, yeah, dividing the area? Yeah, it's a good question. So the achha, grid size like uh, how like this area, this entire area or this small areas uh, you are talking no, about? No, you have a grid. You you have divided the whole thing into some yeah. grids, right? How you yeah. are deciding those grids? Like for yeah. mapping, if hmm. you have to get a node where you have to map that you have to have some like like in this white area one of yeah. the nodes has to belong right otherwise you yeah. could not map yeah correct yeah so, so how do you decide the grid yeah so the thing is uh, here uh, suppose we uh, so this is the workspace that is uh, given to us okay that this is the robot workspace or uh, suppose you assume as a room okay then what is that uh, we calculate this configuration is of the obstacle OK, that that is these are the uh, that is all those blue regions. And then what we do is that we uh, take the you know uh, like we su subtract it from the entire workspace or so we get the uh, free space area. OK, and then what we do is that we keep on. Uh, so so once we have the free space, then we uh, you know decompose the entire workspace into grids uh, like we have some definition of complex cells. OK, so complex cells are cells where you know this free space cuts this node. OK, and then if you draw one line, so it doesn't uh, it shouldn't uh, like it should lie entirely in the free space and like there are three, four criteria of a complex cell. OK, so if the cell is complex, then you divide it. Then again, implement that complex cell into each of the subdivided cell. OK, and then we keep on dividing this until unless we get all the free cells. And if you we'll see like uh, I will give you those, uh, you know, the definition of complex cell. Maybe I don't have in this slide. I will give you the so material. Mukunda, no problem. We got Mukunda. some idea, right? How you yeah. Do this. So Mukunda, yeah, yeah. I, I will just intervene for a second. So but yeah. see, but I will give you a rough example. So earlier, say I was talking about this uh, value iteration algorithms and I was showing you this uh, calculation that how we calculating utility from reward. So if you Remember that I was showing you a robot path when there is uh, no uncertainty in the robot's movement, and I had some. Uh, I used Google Media Pipe to detect hand position. I marked those cells in red, that those are my obstacles, and I am getting a robotic path which is uh, circumspecting those. Now I was increasing the probability in uh, robots uh, uncertainty in the robot's movement. That means. Uh, the robot can go into neighboring cell. I was telling that. And then when I was running the same value iteration algorithm with higher uncertainty in this robot's movement, all this uh, red region was expanding. So right. you, I am not. Right. Uh, I remember. Uh, yes. Uh, and second thing here, as Mukund is explaining, so you can uh, visualize it as a process that 
say in my example was uh, what I did that I have the robots walking envelope. I divided it in equality into 400 cell and I make a equal. Uh, that was very easy that I divide the whole length and breadth as 2020 and I divided the 2020 grid. Now next what he is doing that he is looking at the content of this grid and if this grid contains uh, part of uh, obstacle or part of uh, uh, free space where the robot is allowed to move, he is uh, iteratively further dividing those cells what he is turning at complex cells so that with respect to cell he has some sort of uniformity like there is a class of cell that which belongs to obstacle there is a class of cell which belongs to uh, navigation space and in doing so he is uh, not keeping the cell size uniform so for example say uh, you can uh, resemblance is uh, when i am uh, driving down the gulmohar mark inside i see there is no obstacles i am speeding it up because i know the i can see the road and in any, any free road that I speed up because I have more room for uh, reaction because the road is empty. On the other side, when I can in a congested road, then I will make small incremental movement of the car for uh, subsequent navigation. So then my input will also be discrete that I will not keep on pressing the accelerator pedal. I will give incremental push on it and accordingly I will move steering because uh, I have obstacle maybe every uh, 20 years or 30 years. So something like that you can uh, remember or visualize. OK, yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Mukund, you can yeah. proceed. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So like we can either do it uniformly or we can do it like as I told you, like complex cell divided into simpler cells. So it also is like it. It takes a bit computation, but uh, it eases our path planning algorithm because here we see that there's uh, like the path is very wide and here we see the path is very narrow. So here we need some finer division of grids. So we divide it accordingly. So yeah, so like this we divide. So any other doubt? Any other questions? Okay, so uh, I will first explain Dijkstra's algorithm and A star algorithm is also a, a, an extended version of Dijkstra's algorithm only. So I will explain this in detail and A star is with slight changes. You will know how to implement A star also. So A star I will not go into detail, but yeah, Dijkstra's I will go because it's a basic algorithm. So Dijkstra's algorithm is solution to a single source shortest path problem in graph theory. So basically people who are from data science or computer science background, they might be knowing like what is, you know, like they might have their subject graph theory and it is a, so Dijkstra's algorithm is commonly used like for single source. That is we have only one starter goal position and uh, yeah, and that is the uh, shortest path. Uh, yeah, so it works on both directed and undirected graph. But uh, uh, however, like all the edges must have uh, some non negative weights. Like if the weights are negative, then this algorithm won't work. So it's a drawback of this algorithm also. And the approach is always greedy. So we will, uh, like, I will explain you, like, what is this greedy approach? Okay. And input is, uh, uh, yeah. And the input to the Dijkstra algorithm is a weighted graph. Uh, and that is G, which consists of edges and vertices. Okay. And the source vertex, that is the goal. Which is a subset of which, like which comes under V only, and and all the edges which are uh, which have non-negative weights, <clears throat> and the output is the length of shortest path, okay, from a given start position that is source source to the goal position. So this is the algorithm we see. Uh, first we assign distances. Okay, so instead of going into detail this uh, this algorithm, what I will do is that I will like uh, in uh, in the coming slides, I will just show you. So this is the video. Wait, how will I play this video? So you, so here is a video which is showing Dijkstra's algorithm. So this, so this is start point, and these blue lines are the lines which is searching in the entire workspace. And if you see that the these blue lines are expanding, it means that it's still searching until unless it reaches this goal position. And once the blue line, like the search is this position, it will find a path from start to goal position. So we'll explain this algorithm because here. Yeah, so now you see that it reaches the as soon as the search uh, reaches this position, it finds a path from this 
start to goal or goal to start whatever you say. Meanwhile, it, uh, it also avoids all the obstacle. So this is a simulation for Dijkstra's algorithm. So to, to begin with, so here we have um, two types of sets. First, we have this nodes and this is the uh, visited nodes like Q and S. So Q is basically yeah, that only like uh, what all nodes we have. So these are so using visibility uh, using the, in the previous slides I have told you like uh, using the vis uh, visibility graphs, which I will just. Yeah, using so these are A, B, D, C, D and E are the nodes using using those visibility graphs and these are the you know the uh, the lines that we have created with some edge weights. OK, from one node to another node and suppose there's a point over here in the real workspace. We map it to node A, so node A becomes a start position and similarly any of these nodes could uh, could be our goal position depending on the mapping and then we implement uh, our Dijkstra's algorithm from one node to other uh, to any other node and we find what is the shortest path that we got from Dijkstra's algorithm. And these are basically the number. So these are nodes and these are the uh, edges and these are the weights of each edge. Weights could be anything like cost or anything. So basically we take the distance. Suppose uh, sub, uh, A to C the edge weight is three. It means that the distance is uh, we assume that it is three meter. OK, and he, similarly from a to B, uh, we have 10. It is suppose we assume it is 10 meter and similarly the cost. OK, so the higher the distance, the more is the cost. So uh, so if we are minimizing the cost, it means that we are minimizing the distance. It means that we are finding uh, finding the shortest distance from one point to any other point. So first in this Q, we have A, B, C, D and E. And since we are so we need to minimize. So first we Maximum. So first we give a huge penalty to all these nodes. Uh, okay, except A because suppose A is the start node. We start from A and we give all other nodes as infinity cost. Okay, then we first we put A like we search for A. A is zero and all other nodes is infinity. Same weights. Then what we do? We put so once we search. Uh, so in A we have two options to go either B or to C. Okay, and so in the next step, what we do is that so from A to B, if we go, we incur a cost of 10. So we write 10 over here. Similarly, from A to C, we incur a cost of 3. OK, so we write 3 over here and the rest all is same like D and E. Those are infinity and infinity. And and then once we have explored A, we put A in this visited nodes list of visited nodes. Okay, so now latest cost is this one. Now we see that out of 10, 3, infinity, infinity. What is the minimum cost we got? We got 3 and and 3 for node C. So now we so now we go and explore node C. OK, so from now node C, what two possibilities we have is that we can go from here to a uh, node uh, B. We will incur a cost of 4 and from C we can go to D. We will incur a cost of 8 and from C we can go to E. We will incur a cost of 2. OK, so in then Next slide, what I will do see. So here we have three other uh, three this uh, three ways to go from node C to any other node. So if we go from node C to node B, we, we will invest. Uh, we will incur a cost of four and node C has already, you know, this three cost over here. So three plus four is seven and also seven is less than ten. So if we see over here earlier at node B, we have cost of ten, but now what we see that we got a lesser cost than 10 that is 7 from 3 uh, node C has already 3 plus 4 7. Similarly, if we go to D, we have uh, 3 plus 8 that is 11. So we write over 11 because it is lesser than infinity. Now I think you will get to know that why we are using infinity also over here. And similarly, if we go from node C to node E, we will get 3 plus 2 5. And five is less than infinity, so we will write here five. Okay, so whenever we get a number less than the previous number, we update the uh, we update its cost. And if we get higher number, uh, then we'll not update. We'll keep the previous lower value only. Okay, so now we have explored node C also. We put it in the list of visited nodes. Okay, so again here we find that what is minimum. We we see that five is minimum. So now we explore node E. Okay, so again from node E. What we see is that we have only one option to go. That is from node E to node D. And for that we have a edge weight of five. Like we will incur a cost of five. So node E has already 
Uh, sorry, nine, nine. So we so note E has already a cost of five plus nine, which is fourteen. And now what we see that is for five plus nine, fourteen is less than eleven. Which so here we see that in the previous step for note D we have eleven cost, but now we are getting the five plus nine that is fourteen, which is higher than eleven. So we will not update the cost on note D. We will keep it as eleven only. And similarly, we cannot go to B, so we will keep B as seven only. And since note E is updated, we will put node E back in, uh, you know, again in the list of visited nodes. So now what we have seven and 11 and out of seven and 11, seven is minimum. So now next node we'll explore is node B. So now coming to node B, okay, what? Uh, so from B we have two, uh, two directions we can go. One is from B to C, we will incur a cost of this seven plus this edge weight one, that is eight. But again, eight is higher than uh, it is greater than seven. OK, so we will not update this anyways, like since we are up. Uh, yeah, so like since C is already visited, so we can't update also. OK, because C is already there in the visited nodes. So now the only option is that from B to D we can go and for that we will incur a cost of seven, which is already there on B plus two. That is nine and nine is less than eleven. So we'll update the cost on D as nine. OK. And similarly, if uh, so now we are using so now we have done all all with the like B node. So we put B node in the list of visited nodes. OK, and finally we go. So now the only node is left is D and D has already the cost of nine. OK, and yeah. So we see that like this we have. Uh, defined all the cost which are there like the optimal cost from from going to one place to any other node. Suppose uh, now the question is if we want to go from node A to node C again suppose node A is a start node and node C is a goal node. So we'll get a uh, so we will go by this path because here we know the cost of the minimum cost to reach you know node C from node A is three only. So we will go by this path. Suppose the goal is B. Okay. And we know that the minimum cost to reach goal B, uh, goal B is seven. So we will not take this path because here we get higher cost that it is and that is ten. So instead we take this three plus four seven. So you see even we go, uh, so you see that instead of going straight we'll go by this path because it gives much more you know shorter path or shorter cost. Okay, that is four plus seven. Similarly, if our node is E. And we know that the cost, the, the minimum cost from for like you know for reaching node E or goal E is five. So what path we will take is that three plus two, that is five. Okay. Suppose and similarly, if the suppose if we want to go from node A to node D, we already know that the the, the, the minimum cost with 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 which in, with which we can go from node A to node D is nine. So what path we will take is from here, that is C has already cost of three. OK, three plus how much cost three plus four is seven. Seven plus two is nine. So we will go by this path and we will get the medium cost that is nine. So like this, uh, you know, from uh, from a given start position, we could go to given goal position using the extras algorithm. So first we need to create So first we need to have an entire visibility graph and then you know and then we do a graph search using Dijkstra. We get the optimal cost for each node and then we go backwards or like from from any given position we like we know the minimum cost from the particular start position and then we could define uh, easily define a path that what part we can take so that we uh, we you know we have this minimum cost which is there on each node. So this is the Dijkstra's algorithm. And the application of Dijkstra's algorithm. So if anyone has any doubt over here, they could ask. Uh, maybe uh, you, like not right now, like you might like uh, like if, if you read once, like I will share your slides and all. If you go through it once, you will get to know. Bit, like you will have a more clearer picture. So if you have any doubt, you can ask me right now. Are we storing the minimum cost path? Uh, yeah, we are uh, storing in a sense like. Uh, uh, no, same. Uh, yeah. Once we once we reached into a minimum cost, uh, whether we memorizing that path. Uh, it depends like uh, for the application. If you, yeah, basically, usually for our applications, we memorize that path. 
because um, it's necessary for if like for further use and all again to implement that algorithm it's it, it will be time consuming so it's better we like a story depends on the like trade off if we want to spend on like if we have sufficient memory we store if, if we don't have memory then we can like every time run the algorithm like it depends like as, as such there is no necessary that we should store the shortest path because uh, if we don't store like at least uh, instead of the shortest path if you ask me that are we storing these these weights then yes like we have to store these weights but uh, these edges uh, these edges these weights and these nodes these three things you have to store and rest we, we can do computation every time like we want because this start position is same but this goal position might change or like even a start also might change so we need to run this algorithm again and again so but the thing is this edge weights edge edges and nodes those those things doesn't change so we store those things yeah okay thank you yeah so is there uh, is there any way by which uh, uh, just looking at the set of nodes yeah. uh, you say you don't want to consider this at all uh, for, example, if, for example let's say i just look at it uh, whatever uh, you show here a b c d e yeah let's say there is an fg that's behind a and you know it's behind for some you know for some reason something that's behind you yeah you know yeah. I mean? yeah? yeah is there any criteria like that because on google maps i've seen yeah sometimes you can go back and take a highway and that takes a shorter duration than when you go forward on a local road yeah actually that's a very good question the thing is um if we suppose you have the nodes over backward okay so i will give you an example in the coming slides only that you know uh, so there are many examples actually uh, in dijkstra's algorithm what we do that it searches so, so i have shown you the video also over here uh, wait a second i will again show you this video okay so if you see over here so it kinds of explores the entire workspace okay so like it doesn't know like what is forward what is backward it has to explore the entire workspace it keeps on exploring the entire workspace until and unless it reaches the uh, like it has find all the nodes over here like even if the even if the nodes are backward then also it will find the cost over here and here and all those and finally it will like given the start and goal position it will find the path but yeah it will explore the things at the backward and this is a drawback also and as a good application also the drawback is that suppose in this as you have asked okay like that in this case um now wait a second yeah suppose if we have a node over here also over here also okay so in this case what happened it will explore these two edges also but uh, what happens is that if we it, if it explores these two edges like this f and g anything okay so but uh, the thing is it will take a lot of time okay the computation is expensive because we know that if this is the start position and this is the goal position okay so anyways these two nodes will definitely not be counted if we take the shortest path so our intuition is that we can ignore it and that is exactly what a star does i will explain you but if you go to applications i uh, will like show you the application like google maps and all so you know this dijkstra's algorithm is used in google map okay so if you see google maps google maps never tell you that you have taken the wrong way or it just shows you the one path is it no it is not like that even if you take the wrong path the, the google map redirects it and gives you the path from that particular node so how is it able to do that is because of dijkstra's algorithm only because it explores each and every node in that particular area so wherever node whichever node you go it has some path from that node to the goal node okay so the application the good application is this so that you can you know any time you can redirect your path from given a start and goal position but if you see the computational cost is very much computationally expensive because again like as you have asked like we see that the the nodes which are there at the back side of a that is f or g if we take those are not like we can, just by seeing we could say that those nodes can never be counted because if we take that path it will give a longer path to goal position like if the goal is on the other side so that is the drawback that is really computationally expensive but again the use is that you know the biggest use is there in front of you like google maps and all okay 
so that's the thing is the doubt clear yeah but sometimes uh, yeah. what i said is you go back and there's a highway there yeah and you can you can get to your destination faster yeah okay ha ha okay so like yeah but the thing is here uh, here they do they don't consider time like if you if uh, if you want to include uh, like include time also then there's other type of algorithms are there but here in dijkstra's and aster uh, like basically you have to add some cost which uh, which are time dependent also but here we don't see time here we see only the distance so yeah so we are not optimizing time over here only the distance we are optimizing okay, okay. yes yeah. yeah so any other doubts okay so this dijkstra's algorithm is used for traffic information system uh, okay and used for google maps okay mapping and various other uh, routing systems and all so then we go to, go on to aster algorithm so aster algorithm is a most popularly used you know graph search algorithm because it's very time optimal like uh, like not time uh, yeah because it's very computationally expensive it takes only those nodes you know which are uh, which it actually needs to take because it's a kind of directed search we could say uh, if i show you the video we'll understand how it searches okay and it and also it gives the shortest path uh, between initial uh, between a uh, between two given positions and it's why and, and it's not only widely used in robotic application but many other applications are there where we use graph aster algorithm okay it's similar to dijkstra's algorithm and except that it guides the search towards the most promising uh, promising states you know and, and and hence you know saving significant computation time okay and uh, yeah so the yeah it's least expensive the base algorithm uses the least expensive path and expands it using function shown below so this is the function that is f of n is equals to g of n plus h of n okay so so it it is a function so in the in the dijkstra's algorithm what we see is that there is no h of n it is only f of n is equals to g of n so g of n is the cost from the start node to that particular node that is g of n so like we we have no all those edge weights so edge weights are nothing but the distance from to do, uh, to that particular node from the start node okay we have seen no that 10 3 and all those are edge weights so those are the cost or the distance from start node to that particular node but here to you know take into account the directed search we have one other that is heuristic cost that is h of n so heuristic cost is that uh, if a particular node is there the heuristic cost can be anything like uh, usually we use nearest neighbor heuristic okay which which tells us that you know what is the cost for for that but uh, what is the cost or the distance from that particular node to the goal node so we have two types of cost for a node one is the cost from the start node and this uh, to that particular node and the second cost is that from that node to the goal node so indirectly what is that is it captures both the the distance from the start position also and the distance from the goal position also and it does adds it up and that is f of n that is the total cost and it tries to optimize this total cost okay so we see in that dijkstra's algorithm we are only concerned with the start position we have no idea about what is goal position later on we implement that what is goal but in a star we already have goal position and we take the goal position also into account and both the cost okay and similarly we optimize the entire everything is same okay only the thing only thing changed is here we have from 10 to 3 we have this uh, this cost only 3 is there but here we uh, but in aster if we go we will have this cost also 8 plus 2 or any other like direct cost from here to here anything like from suppose d is the goal so we have this cost plus this cost and then everything is same priority queues and all those the visited nodes everything is same so coming to application um, maybe i will give you some materials to read on this aster so it's simple only similar to dijkstra but only we have one another extra heuristic cost and uh, so if we see that one common question is that like aster uh, so how aster is a form of dijkstra is that if we have h of n is equals to 0 then aster becomes dijkstra's algorithm so its applications is manufacturing industries you know uh, like to go like to navigate robot from one position to any other position then 
manipulators, you know, fixed base manipulator, mobile robot, social navigation. We all use this algorithm. So I will show you some videos if I have. So this is a star algorithm search. Here is start position and here goal position we go and then we draw some random very complex sort of obstacle so that there's hardly any path left. But and we see that a star is still able to find the path. So these are the obstacles that we are creating. We create a very complex environment. Like this. And then we implement a, a star search and we see that these light blue lines are the search space that it has created and th that blue colored lines is the uh, wait a second here we are. Yeah, so this blue color line is the line that is uh, uh, that the final path that we obtained from the a star and this light blue is the search space that it has searched. And similarly, the thing is, uh, and if we don't have, and if we make further complex environment, if we give that there's no such path. So in that case, the A star will return that there's no path connecting the start and goal position. Hello, am I audible? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, my this system is hanged. Yes. Wait, 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 this is hang. I need to. I'm just restarting my this PowerPoint. You have class till one o'clock, no? Yeah, yeah. Then I will, then so I will from the video we can see that uh, it's not like exploring whole uh, search space it just find a way and yeah. Then stop. yeah yeah so because of this heuristic cost because it already have an idea where is the goal position and that's why like it's very computationally less expensive and other thing so and if you see that but what in case if there is another path which is less cost no, see, see like, uh, OK, wait, I'll come to that point. So here in this case, uh, since there's no path, so it will return that there's no path to the start and goal position. Yeah, so if there's another path, so the, the thing is A star will, so like there can be many paths from one for given start and goal position, but A star gives the shortest path because here we are minimizing this total cost. This is the cost from start. This is the cost to, uh, like, and, and this is the cost from goal okay the the distance so here we are minimizing the distance it means that we are taking only the shortest path okay like if there's two points and there's no obstacle it means that it will give a straight line path because the straight line is the shortest path so it will just give you a straight line okay if there are some obstacle it might give you a curve path but that path will be the shortest in distance in terms of distance not in terms of time as someone has asked before not in terms of time but it will give terms of distance the shortest path other paths it will not give it will give only the shortest one so that's the thing okay yeah so there's one comparison between uh, a star and dexter's algorithm so if i i will run this video first so this the left one is a star and this and and the right one is dexter okay so given a start position and given yeah then we implement the c how quickly this a star it gives the path and now this drag star okay. similarly for each case you use you see given a start this green one is start and red one is goal a star always takes the least time and also because it like least time because it search because it search space is very less 
okay so like this for a more complex environment also here in this case i think dexter will give good results faster no here also a star gives yeah so like this okay so for if you see the if the pass distance is short then both a star and extra might perform same but uh, if the if the path length is like if the environment is very complex and the start and goal position is very far away then a star will definitely perform better than dijkstra's algorithm and depends on application so coming to the differences like comparison search algorithm a star uses best first search or directed search and dijkstra's algorithm uses greedy first search or blind search blind search in a sense that it doesn't have the idea uh, idea of the goal position time complexity is order of n log n and here in dijkstra's algorithm it is order of n square so we see that dijkstra algorithm has higher time complexity heuristic function is f of n is equals to g of n plus h of n and here f of n is equals to g of n only h of n is zero because there is no heuristic cost a rate of convergence we we saw from videos and other things like it, it can be proved also and uh, uh, like uh, using proper mathematics uh, like, like, like using proper mathematics that a star has higher rate of convergence and dijkstra has lower rate of convergence okay so our next algorithm so is rrt algorithm that is stands for rapidly exploring random tree and one advanced version of it is rrt star that yeah rrt star so basically these are all global path planning algorithm in the second slide i have told you okay so in this algorithm what we do is that i will just take my uh, pointer where is my laser pointer yeah so yeah so here suppose we have any you know start position any goal position in the entire workspace over uh, here then then what we is that we sample okay so we take n is the number of iterations v is the initial vertex and edge is zero okay like initially we have no edge and any any point is x initial we assign it to v and for number of iterations n we sample the entire boxes like we randomly create points in the entire workspace okay so suppose this is the random point over here okay and we see that which point is nearest to this random point in this tree okay suppose okay uh, you yeah, can yeah in this tree so we find that this is the nearest point so we assign it x nearest okay and then we connect these two not connect actually we draw a dotted line between these two and then we take a distance eta that is some distance which the you know which we want like some threshold distance because the tree shouldn't be very long okay so otherwise some obstacle or like or anything so we take some small distance eta and in that from x nearest at eta distance we create uh, we have one more uh, like we create one node that is x new and then we join this x new uh, from x nearest to x new we join okay so finally we have this node so like this from a given point on tree keep on you know drawing uh, you know its branches like uh, our tree keep on keeps on expanding it branches first it explores a random point it joins the random point with the nearest position in the tree it takes some threshold distance and makes the new node over here and then it joins the nearest node with the new node and 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 now this new node is also like also become the part of this tree like this the tree keep, keeps on increase, increasing its branches okay so like this uh the node explores so, uh, suppose if if we see that okay and here's the another case so this is the random node that we created and the nearest node we see over here is this one so we draw a dotted line between these two and the distance eta if it's greater than this two distance then we remove eta and we just directly connect this x new and this x nearest so like this it's keep on branching increasing its branches and including the nodes in the tree and like this we do for the entire suppose this is the workspace and we do this in the entire workspace and okay and once we have trees for entire workspace uh, so given a start and a goal position we connect all these nodes like suppose this is a start and this is a goal okay so we connect like this 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 okay to reach from given position to go so this is a goal this is a start so if we go from here 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 like this then depending on the branches like wherever there is branch there will be path Okay, so I will show you one video over here. Yeah, so 
you see that this is start position. This is a goal position and like this it keeps it keeps on making branches. It's keep it means it keeps on expanding into branches until unless it reaches the you know goal position like every time it creates a branch it will search that whether it is able to create a path from goal to start if it's not then it will keep on expanding At the moment it saw that it has created this path it will stop further searching So see, uh, as soon as it, it created this node, it could find a path from this node from this node. So it will give you this path, the red color path. OK. Remember here, one thing is that here RIT algorithm doesn't give you the optimal path. It is not the shortest path. It is just some path, some random path between you know this position and uh, between start and goal position. And it can give you more than one path like at a time it will give you only one path only, but if you so like if you run the algorithm next time, maybe it will give you some path from here like this. OK, so because it doesn't guarantee the shortest path. So and and it depends completely on sampling that how you sample. So it's very useful for narrow spaces. But also it doesn't give you the shortest or the optimal path. And here we show you that one PR2 robot is there that is Spinar uh, Robotic 2 and uh, uh, sorry planar rotary 2 robot and we implement uh, rit algorithm in this robot so you see that those hand movements are gone by you know rit algorithm so there are other variations are this rit connect and like rit connect is that uh, suppose in this uh, uh, we start uh, like branching from the uh, from given goal position. Okay, here we start branching from this goal position. Okay, but in RT connect, what do we do is that we start branching from this goal position also. Uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, in RT. What we do is that we start from this start position branching, but in RT connect we also start from this uh, goal position. So simultaneously we start making trees from both these direction, and where it will intersect, then we will just draw a path. So it is it takes some less time because it's branching from both the directions. So yeah. So any doubt? What is the software that you are using for uh, illustrating this? Uh, uh, so like uh, this one. So yeah, this, this one is, or the previously also you have the yeah, shown so, the Easter search and all. What is that sure, you are using? Sure, like uh, here, uh, like these things, uh, like we have done in two types of thing, like uh, software. One is MATLAB, and the other one is Python. Like uh, Professor Pipta sir, like uh, uh, Pipta sir does in uh, C sharp, but uh, we like uh, we do MATLAB and Python. So anything like we have now. So now, so now these mm -hmm. algorithms are so robust. So that we have inbuilt libraries also built in them. So we just okay. need to give them in better. Python. You have inbuilt library for this. Yeah, Python also we have inbuilt library and MATLAB okay. also we have inbuilt okay. library. So any software would work. Yeah. Because these are very standard algorithms as of now. Uh, and so like many people, they're creating their own you know, libraries and package and they upload it over there. So yeah. You can code also. It's very simple. So one doubt like when I was teaching in the previous some few months before to some 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 industry people only. So uh, I will not answer that question like it has proper derivation. That's why. So the thing is he asked me a question that that Mukund why these branches are going faster and these branches are going slower. OK, so. He asked me that question and actually this proper reason it's based on the sampling rate and what we do like how do we sample and all so it depends so like uh, in this area we have given like like this as more weights so that's why it's searching from here so this if you go into a bit into derivation that how these samples and all so we'll get to know that we can also give some weights that where to find you know 
some bias to basically, basically should say some biased paths we could give. So here we have done this. So yeah, that was a question over here. Yeah, so okay, you, 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 I was thinking that it is like random, like in some in yeah. different runs, it would be in different places. It will be drawing faster. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, it is like that only actual algorithm is like that only. Mm -hmm. Okay, but also you can give in that sampling also. It's like suppose you can give uniform distribution to sampling or you can give any other distribution like, you know, like instead of just randomly sampling, you know, like it's like we can just give, okay, you sample 100 points in this area and 20 points in this area okay. or you take okay. or you take some Gaussian distribution like you sample more points in the middle portion and less and, and and less points in the you know exterior portion you can you can give your own sampling slapping uh, sampling criteria to this and if not you can just give random points also so it's the case okay. okay so now coming to rrt star it's just same as rrt only okay uh, so like you guys want break or like shall i take in this no please continue i think it's okay 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 fine fine so coming to uh, so anyways, there are not much slides after RIT star. I think one we will discuss this DWA that is, you know, is local path planning and yeah, means that would be a last topic only. So hardly one topic is left after this. So yeah, it's fine only. So this RRT star is similar to RRT only here. We can see the diagram. So I will just show you with my laser pointer. Yeah, so similarly, we sample this X random. We find the nearest node to the tree. We draw dotted line. Then at some distance eta, we create some new node. Because once we get the new node, we add this new node to the tree. Okay. But then what is there like to sample new point? What we do is that we take a critical radius that is Rn or threshold radius Rn, and and we draw a circle from this new node. And the next time, what if we search no? You know, like instead of taking the nearest. So in this case, what happened? Suppose the uh, you know, OK, so I will first explain what is happening. So we take this circle over here, imaginary circle, and then for for looking for this uh, like and and then we again sample as we used to sample. OK. And then like uh, and when we see the shortest, like what is the shortest node from this given node? We consider only this circle, like whatever points are there or whatever nodes are lie in this circle. We take only those nodes and then we find that what is near to this node. The, the thing so why we are doing is that if we consider the original RIT algorithm, suppose a new node is here. OK, so or, or, or let us take this example only. Suppose this uh, random node is somewhere generated over, generated over here. OK, and suppose the T instead of orienting over this side, it's a bit oriented over this side. But our goal is somewhere over here. Then what happens? This random node will take this node as the nearest point. Okay, and then it will it will like, you know, orient like it will go towards the opposite direction of the goal. Okay, so instead of what we do is that we create a, you know, limiting like we limit the amount, you know, that, uh, you know, the area in which it searches for the nearest node. By doing this, what happens? It saves a lot of time, actually not less time, but it, it saves a lot of time, you know, in searching for the nearest node because for searching the nearest node, it has to calculate its distance for each and every node in this entire workspace. Are you getting what I'm saying? Like if this is the new node, okay, to search for the nearest node. So like if this is a random node and this is the nearest node, how we get to know this, that this is the nearest node. We calculate this distance. We calculate this distance. We calculate this distance and E from this node. We have to calculate each and every distance. So it takes a lot of time. So what we do is that we just create a circle over here and we take only limited points which are which lie in the circle and in and and through that only we you know connect uh, like like we find the nearest node and we connect that node. Rest all is same over here. Just we try to limit the circle and similarly in this case if eta is greater than the threshold, we again do the same thing. Like this, like this things happen over here. So it's the same thing. And yeah, like same. Oh, okay. One important thing I forgot to tell you is that okay, in any of this case, suppose this is a RRT algorithm, RRT algorithm. If this new node lies in the obstacle area, then obviously we will not consider that area. Okay, like I forgot to mention you. Okay, so means is the basic thing that if you do path planning, 
our you know our point shouldn't lie in the obstacle space otherwise there's no point of drawing a path so if if this point lies in the obstacle space then remove it if it lies in the obstacle free space then we can go further and take this into our tree yes similarly with this also we check whether it's collision free or not if it's collision free then we add it to our tree otherwise if it's lie in the obstacle then we don't take okay so like this it goes i will just show you some other video of yeah. so this thing you see that we have done in matlab so this rt star algorithm see that it catching branches and then uh, uh, once once it finds a path it will find a path from given start and goal position and this is the pr2 robot we have implemented rt star do that okay so comparison between rt and rt star so here left one is rt right one is rt star we see that rt star you know since uh, yeah like you can just see the video here one is thing is that rt star is less computationally expensive but it has very slow rate of convergence okay because it has to create that circle so here it has no worries about you know like where the just simply samples and samples and keep on sampling and just draw a path but here like it first samples then draw uh, like boundary and then take the minimum cost and then again from that it joins and all those things are there so its rate of convergence has bit slow but yeah it consumes less memory but here it it consumes more memory but it's also give faster results quicker results darun ei python ar matlab eigulo je visualization jinish adbhut sundor so you see like so you see like this is the rt and this is rt star and uh, we see that rt is taking like it's it's bit faster and this rt star is taking longer time and uh, like here the uh, here is the comes Yes. one second i think uh, madam is asking something about that how the visualization is done i think uh, she, he not, used to no i think uh, he he no, already told, told that. it is in that was i uh, by mistake i was unmuted okay oh okay okay, okay. sorry <laughs> okay. sorry proceed please proceed yeah yeah sure yeah. like ma'am is amazed by like how this uh, like the visualization is very good in python and matlab so yeah so the thing is yeah coming to path optimality this uh, rt is are uh, why this video is not here yeah so coming to path optimality uh, rt is less optimal okay and and also it sometimes it gives more, like like path of bit slightly higher cost but this rt star is more optimal and it gives comparatively less cost but not the least cost okay and rate of convergence as you can see from the video this rt is very fast and uh, and and this uh, rt star is slow and tree density is almost the same like it samples the same amount of yeah points over there so tree density is almost the same so coming to so now we have the global path planning algorithm we see that all the obstacles and all those things are static in this environment but what happens suppose uh, if there's if there's a human over here and the human is moving and like it's changing its position okay from time to time so in this case we cannot have a global path okay because it it may intersect like uh, the human may come into the path okay into the globally planned path so in that case we need to have local path planning and the most commonly used and readily used local path planning is dwa that is dynamic window approach so yeah, as you can see from the figure so here we uh, discretize and maximize a, a given uh, 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 an 
objective function which is given by uh, which has three parameters basically the heading the distance and the velocity so i will just not go into the that much detail but i will give you an overall idea that is what is actually happening over here so coming to so suppose this is the actual robot position okay and this is the and this is human okay so the robot cannot obviously bump into human so it has to take slightly this turn curve turn and it has to go over here and this is a target position okay so this heading is basically the angle between this position that is, the, that is the angle theta over here that is this position and this position so in a sense is that the robot always has to so our path planning uh, this dwa always uh, takes and uh, takes care of this heading angle so this should be minimum like if it's turning it's fine but as soon as it avoid this human it should minimize this angle theta so that it goes towards the target it doesn't deviate from the target okay and distance distance is this distance the distance from human uh, distance from robot to human this distance so this distance should also be uh, some some threshold so that human doesn't collide and meanwhile the human shouldn't you know change its parts very far away like very far from human so uh, if it changes its path you know at a very large distance then the path will not be optimal and if it comes very close to the human and then changes its path then it may collide or the human you know may you know not feel safe to work in that environment so it takes care of this distance and and then the velocity that what velocity that velocity here accounts for both angular and linear velocity is so v and w okay of this human uh, like which are basically the input control input so all these like heading distance and velocity they all you know are written in terms of v and w that is linear velocity and angular velocity and finally uh, we have one optimization function in terms of v and w and we you know minimize that optimization function and finally we get a path okay so so heading we uh, so the heading gives the alignment of robot with that of direction of target distance give the distance of the clo uh, closest obstacle uh, and that is the human in this case uh, in the corresponding uh, like uh, if the corresponding w uh, v and w are chosen so v and w are linear velocity and angular velocity suppose one example is that uh, this theta theta can be given by d omega by dt okay so basically that is theta uh, no sorry i have yeah theta can be given by omega into dt okay so yeah yeah theta in radians yeah yeah theta is equals to omega into dt so like this everything like heading you know this distance distance is speed into time so we can you know you know we can give distance also in terms of speed that is v so everything we write in terms of v and w and then we optimize the given function and then uh, and uh, with respect to v and w and then we finally calculate optimal value of this v and w and we give it to the robot at that particular time instant so based on that particular v and w the robot changes uh, changes its direction so this is the overall you know idea of this dw algorithm uh, it's uh, this is the basic equation and this consists some integral terms that as i have told you that this theta can be written as uh, theta can be written as omega into dt integral omega into dt this distance similarly distance is equals to v into dt like this and velocity and all those things and then we finally optimize this and we get the value of v and omega and then those v and omega are the control inputs to a robot and then the robot follows that particular action at that particular time and like this it avoids the obstacle then there are other so this is the most commonly used i will show you how we have implemented these things in our robot uh, in a robot in a lab okay that is startup bot we are using and then there are other local path planners like tb that is stamped elastic band you know and there are many other learning based path planner path planner like using like neural networks and enforcement learning where i am working currently so yeah so i will show you In some videos how do you come with those alpha beta gammas so alpha, alpha beta, beta uh, yeah so alpha beta, beta gamma beta. the yeah hello yes. uh, yeah so this alpha beta gamma uh are the are the bounding parameters like uh, you can choose any value to bound this so like if you want to the thing is when you do optimize no all these value suppose uh this has uh, this heading has very high value and this two uh have very low value 
so when we do optimize no uh, 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 it will be optimized only with respect to this uh, we are not giving much importance to this but so suppose uh, for uh, what we do is that we choose some values of this alpha beta and gamma such that all these three parameters have equal weightage like the the best thing is that to convert each of these things between 0 and 1 okay like if you okay like between 0 and 1 so that each term has equal contribution to this optimization function so based on suppose if this this comes out uh, uh, in the order of 100 and this comes in the order of 1 or 2 so what we do is that we divide these things by 10 okay so this alpha will be something around 0.1 and this beta will be 1 so like this we just see so that all the parameters are in the like have equal consideration okay i understand yeah, understand no so basically it's a, i should say it's hit and trial only but uh, while experience we uh, we have some standard sets of values like what people are taking so we usually take those values only but uh, yeah it uh, the main idea behind this is that only we check that all of them should have equal contribution to this function Okay. Any other question? Okay. So coming to this DWA algorithm. So in this figure, uh, so in this video we have. Uh, okay. So I will explain you. So this is the virtual obstacles we have created uh, using uh, mixed reality. That is a uh, uh, mixed reality interface using Microsoft HoloLens 2. and this is a virtual building and also we have real obstacles also. I, uh, I will show you in this figure uh, in this video. and this is a robot turtle board the video might not be that much wait yeah so uh, okay sorry yeah so this this is the turtle board the uh, robot is there and it avoids this virtual obstacle as well as the real obstacle is there and the global plus planning that we use here over here is a star i will show you how uh, in the screen somewhere it will come in between and uh, Okay, first instead of this, I will show you this video. And, and so the global path planning we use is A star, and the local path planner that we use is um, uh, DW, that is dynamic window approach. Okay, so I will show you. And okay, so this is the robot turtle boat, and yeah. and these bottles are the obstacles over here, and also these chairs, sofas, and all those things are obstacles. Okay, ha. Huh. So coming to this, so we see that uh, this is a kind of uh, I've told you know beginning of this what what is mapping. Okay, there's one so there's also one more thing called localization that robot localizes itself in the environment. You see that this the area these all the these are the areas. Okay, means the robot has to know that at which point like at which x comma y point is is he there in the environment. Okay, so that is called localization. So we are using here. Monte Carlo localization, advanced, uh, yeah, Monte Carlo, uh, Monte Carlo localization, and the global path planning is A star and then DWA. So we'll see that if you draw a path from one place to another place, uh, the it will find a green color path and then it will try to follow that path, and yeah. So so this is simultaneous. So this overall process is called simultaneous localization and mapping. Okay, like it simultaneously localizes itself and at the same times so it maps the environment also and how it maps is that using lidar so if we so, so this is a turtle bird and above this you can see one top circular thing it's continuously rotating that is lidar that is light detection and ranging so it sends an you know infrared ray and it can, and the ray goes and it you know and it then reflects on the obstacle and it again comes back to it and the, and the, the, the total distance uh, is the Total time taken, uh, sorry, its speed into total time taken divided by two. So we will get the distance to each of to each obstacle in the environment, and like this, it you know, maps like where are the obstacles and all those stuffs, and then it follows that particular path. Let me see. Now we give some point that so so here have have you seen like uh, wait
fish want to show you that. Okay, fine. Like if you see, then what's happening? We see in the screen that there will there, there will be one red arrow and then one, one black path over here. Now you see it carefully. So that's the path that we got from A star and DWA. So our robot is here. Then we get so so that path black color path is the path that we obtained. So you see we have stored uh, this, that, that someone has asked me that do we store the shortest path? So we don't store the shortest path. We store the all the nodes and all in the environment like where are obstacles, where are all those things. And then we directly change the start and goal position, a start and goal position, and the algorithm quickly computes the path. Or like it follows. Similarly, in the in this video, so this virtual virtual obstacles, and the robot is avoiding virtual obstacles also. So, so you see that it's going back and forward. This is because you know this local path planning that is dynamic window approach. It just changes its path. Like what happens sometimes there is very small space. Okay, so at that time it's unable to find a path. So that it. Uh, so at that time what happens is that there's some you know recovering criteria that if it doesn't able to find a path, then it goes few centimeter backwards and then it again so find uh, then it again find a new path from there. So that's why it's it's going back and forth over there at that time. So you see here also similar map and all were created using slam in the slam that is simultaneous localization and mapping. And yeah. This is the manipulator. And you see that the robot is avoiding all the obstacles and it's going from one place to another. OK, so coming to so this is the last slide. Uh, uh, so for DW algorithm, the you know it slowly it maximizes the distance and uh, maximizing slowly the distance and the velocity and it has no incentive or, or to move towards the goal. OK. And maximizing uh, only heading robot will not move around the obstacles. These all the th so these all things I've already explained. Like using all these three components, over a robot will move around obstacles as fast as it can. Local approaches are better to avoid obstacles. So so these are the things that why we are using DWA. Okay. So low computational complexity. Sometimes the robot gets stuck in local optimum. So this is the same thing that I was telling you over there that like why the robot is going back and forth because it was just stuck in a kind of local optimum and there was. No, so and there was no global optimum, so like it's it was not able to find a path. So in that case, it has to go a bit backward and then again start the computation. So that's it. So if if anyone has any doubt, they could ask me. Uh, are there situations where uh, the robot moves forward but uh, is not able to come out of the situation? Like, uh, uh, yeah, there are many such cases, but the thing is, uh, uh, we have to give some recovery thing to like, yeah, like there are many cases that the robot gets so, like, not only that robot. You know, it's stuck and it's not able to find a path. There are many cases in which robots, uh, the the path planning algorithm kind kind of gets in a infinite loop also that it keep on continuously finding path, 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 but it's never able to reach the goal position. So at that case also, we need to stop the path planning algorithm. But usually there are some recovery criteria that after this much iterations, if the robot doesn't find a path, then stop the path planning or go backward and then again replan the path. Like this, there are many. No recovery criteria, but yeah, there are many situations, especially with the uh, like um, these uh, 
uh, reinforcement learning or neural network based criteria these things are very common that they like they usually uh, so that's why we are not still hardly you know mit cheetah like they are using this you know like they have only like they are only successfully implementing this you know path planning using neural networks or reinforcement learning but uh, rest all it's like there are a lot of challenges in that that it kind of gets stuck in that particular loop or it's not able to find a proper optimal like global optimal path and all so yeah there are such situations okay thanks And also like uh, regarding the chess that I was talking, that you uh, like that we were discussing and the thing maybe you know one of the common reason is that if the robot was so uh, now you're getting now I think you got a bit idea is that you know to avoid human hand so it has to its algorithm should should be very strong with respect to local path planning okay because the hand is continuously moving so this all optimization functions should be very much you know you know very much quick and you know real time if there's slight delay then the robot will collide with human hand or any other moving obstacle so this has to be very quick and real time so that the robot doesn't you know bump into the obstacle so like this thing global path is fine like from one place to another but to avoid the moving obstacles this thing should be very you know you know computationally good and and other stuff yeah so i think i am not telling that that might be only reason I think that this could be one of the reason. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about moving obstacles. You yeah. showed this, uh, you know, like a path finding uh, yeah. by the robot on on the screen, not the real one. Yeah. Uh, you showed the different algorithms. So we have this uh, anything like a random generator of obstacles, and, uh, and okay. the algorithm finds paths as the obstacles crop up. Could yeah, be actually. One. Yeah, actually, I we have done the we have done those things, but let me see that whether we have the video or not. So this is a detailed part. I uh, we have uh, we have done those things, but I but we don't have video, I suppose. So I will give you the video. Okay, we have recorded videos, so right now I don't have. So maybe because of that, yeah. We have done those things, and that's very common. Like it's sim simple. Like if you put one leg in front of the leader of robot, then it will, you know, regenerate new path. So that's the thing. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other doubt? Okay, then, uh, Professor, uh, can you just stop recording? Stop sharing my screen. <laughs>